So this is an event on spiritual emergencies. Well, one definition of them is a powerful shift in one's usual sense of identity and reality, which can be quite uh, disturbing uh, uh, and upsetting, and which psychiatry has often treated as just kind of bog-standard uh, psychosis requiring medication, perhaps for the rest of your life. But, um, but these can be, if sensitively handled, um, opportunities for awakening uh, and, and amazing transformation and growth and insight. Spiritual experience for me is simply an expanded bandwidth of perception that encompasses both these levels of reality and sometimes reaches all the way into the source itself. Spiritual emergency is when that happens without a context or a story for it, or a guide or adequate containment, within the individual or within the culture. What could be a successful integrated uh, initiation into larger self or reality becomes instead intensely traumatizing and terrifying. A failed initiation, as Joseph Campbell would say. So instead of leading to transformation, it actually ends up leading to fragmentation and at times, annihilation. So with that in mind, we begin. I just first wanted to say thank you so much, Jules, for inviting me to do this, because as I was speaking with Lou, it feels a little bit like a coming out, um, because I think there is something, like everyone here has mentioned, there's something about a society where uh, if you say to someone, oh, I've had a psychotic episode or a psychotic break or a really, really, really bad nervous breakdown, you kind of get this you know, there's this kind of stepping back. Um, and so it feels, it feels just really good to be able to speak about it in this, in this space and with these people. So I really like the term psycho-spiritual crisis because psychosis to me feels like it focuses too much on the pain and the shame and the kind of disgust that comes with that word. And there's something about um, spiritual emergence that for me, sort of what Anthony was saying, that focuses too much on the, the beauty and the divine and, and actually doesn't acknowledge the real pain and the terror that comes, often comes, well, I think probably always <laughs> comes with these kind of, this kind of shedding and, and rebirth. I think they're quite polarized positions and actually a big part of my healing journey has been about recon reconciling these two, these polarized positions and coming to a place of ambiguity. And, and the, more, the more ambiguity I, could, I can hold, the healthier and more connected to the world and to myself that I feel. There's also another kind of way of, of growing, which is a bit like a revolution. So as opposed to evolution, you can have a positive revolution where there's like a die off. You know, this, this structure from birth, maybe as a baby with your family, you. you you evolve some kind of personality, stability, way of relating and being here in this space with all of the difficulties and bits of traumas and quirks that we are. And that stable structure builds up like a building going higher and higher. But uh, at, at some stage in life, it's perhaps healthy or natural for that building to collapse, especially if there's traumas or there's real problems, but it could be any reason. So this is, it can be from a sort of an inner spiritual urge or something, I don't know. This is unique, but it's something human. It felt like I was on the ocean floor and I had the silvering cord of my breath. And that was all that was holding me to reality. And it really took everything I had not to jump out of a window at that point. So two things really helped me. One was my friends. Um, again, very, very lucky. I had uh, two gainfully unemployed friends at the time who could look after me. And uh, they'd dose me up with Valium. They'd sort of say, take the edge off, Lou, and give me a little bit of Valium if I got too uh, distressed. And they fed me, and they held me, and they made me laugh. And they tried to get me to watch Disney films, which frankly terrified me even more. Shrek used to make me sob. Everything felt so turned up, the noise, the sound. I'd be in the middle of the road and in front of traffic and I just wouldn't even be able to get across the road. I wouldn't even understand what a road was. Words were complete nonsense, nothing connected. And for all I'd read and knew at that time, none of it helped. There was not one single idea that helped me through that. It was purely breathing and my friends.
So afterwards, after this, I felt completely detached from material reality. Even before this, I was struggling to open doors. I was struggling to connect to the way you were describing the solidness of reality. And if I had had more support, I would have been able to be like, oh, I'm experiencing another type of reality, another part of reality. But I didn't have that. So I was just, again, terrified because everything was disintegrating. And I had no support. And I didn't want support because I was terrified of being locked away. I didn't know that people had these experiences. So I was just terrified of being locked away. So I had to keep pretending, which I think made it much worse. There were bursts of really awesome energy, sort of like beyond MDMA or a really good acid trip. Um, just things were just glorious. And I didn't have to feel the pain. So I chased them through drugs and things. And then I went and I did a transpersonal counseling course, which is about um, basically like a looking things from a spiritual perspective. And that was really, really helpful too, sort of shamanic rituals and trances. But I realized that again, I was just bypassing the pain, bypassing the pain. So uh, re uh, religious stuff, Christian things, Buddhist things, I'm the Buddha, yeah? If someone ever says, or if you ever think, oh, I'm, I'm Jesus or the Buddha, okay, this is okay, <laughs> yeah? It's a kind of joke. This is, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing insane about that. The only, the only thing is if you get confused, that you forget that you are that, everyone is that, but you forget that you're also this as well, and that if, if I'm Jesus, you're also Jesus. So the human being is, is not just this surface little thing that's here. We, we have this real depth in, inside of, of, what should I say, I don't know, archetypes, Jungian stuff. Yeah, everything I experience, a wolf, an angel, all different things. So things that you, you can find if you look in the right places, but you don't find it in the bank or in the newspaper generally. So there's not, we don't have a s spiritual society. And so there's no reference point there's no way to relate to these experiences, which is why we just push them out and get afraid of them and push them behind a the curtain. So in answer to Jules's question, where, where is psychiatry on, on this? Well, still, still, not, still not doing very well. Psychiatry is, is meaningless. Psychiatry is generally not interested in meaning. It's more to do with symptom, manage, symptom control and risk management. Whereas the area that we're talking about is, is all about meaning. It's all about mining meaning, processing meaning, integrating meaning. Some of the meaning is, you know, is, is easily assimilable. It's like the low hanging fruit. Other meaning, it's much harder to, to, to gather. It takes a lot of work and persistence. Really hard to do, um, really hard to do on your own. So some huge problems with psychiatric training. I mean, most psychiatrists have never done any work on themselves. Um, so the Scottish psychoanalyst R.D. Lang used to say, psychiatrists need to do three things, have an analysis, take LSD, and I've forgotten what the third one was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think what's missing from psychiatry is, is a sense of the archetypal. So the conventional psychiatric model is the biopsychosocial, which, which is fine, but the archetypal model adds something very different. I think everyone said that it was meditation or breathing and connection to friends. And those are the two main things that I, as now working as a psychotherapist, I can see that it's really about connecting to the body, not bypassing the body, connecting to the body. And, um, and then also relating, not just to the hallucinations or the oneness that we experience in those states, but actually to you know, physical people. So touching is important and, and really feeling that connection. The world is really in a conversation now. It's alive from its own side. And it feels like a kind of magic show increasingly. Um, and I think it's relevant for now because I do believe we're moving into a, a global shift. Um, and I think just as the world is darkening, there's also a quickening that's happening. And a lot of people are starting to awaken out of ordinary consciousness. And the bandwidth of awareness is growing very, very fast for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, with that, if you don't have a context and you don't have a guide and you don't have the containment, you are going to be a little bit unsteady in that if that's happening. So, 
just be aware that there are people around, not enough, of, unfortunately, Jules and I were talking about this the other day, there aren't enough people, ordinary people, who are not um, in the New Age, who are not in a religion, who've just had these experiences, um, talking about it in a way that makes it actually quite normal, because it is actually quite normal. It's our birthright. We have just narrowed reality to such a tiny point that we can't even see that anymore. So. I just think we're moving into a time where we're going to need ordinary miracles from ordinary people and it's going to take all of us to save the situation we are in collectively. Um, but that starts with starting to realise how powerful you are and it starts with realising that you're not alone either in this cosmos. Um, it's not just us human beings fighting Donald Trump, there's a lot more going on. Just. Remember that we're born for these times and darkness sharpens as the light opens. Thank you. Thank you very much.